There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. I'm glad you're all here, because I, I, I have a project for you at the end, so we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Everybody talks about Indian Jenny. Have you ever thought about why they just talk about Indian Jenny? We don't talk about many other local Native American people. They, we don't. We don't know who they are, quite frankly. But I think the biggest reason we talk about Jenny is that we have a photograph of Jenny. And so we up here on the table. And so we have a face to put with a name. Unfortunately, Peter Britt, who took the picture, or Peter or his son Emil, we're not sure which one took the picture, when Peter Britt came to Oregon and to Jackson County, he came in 1852. He stepped right into the middle of all the Indian Wars. And he was a portrait. He took portraits. Of, that, that, that's, that's what he photographed. He didn't go out and take Crater Lake pictures until much later. He didn't take pictures of the Native Americans in their natural habitat because their natural habitat was being attacked. Within four years of his arrival, all the Native Americans in the valley were gone. They had been, they had been moved up north. So there wasn't anyone for him to take a picture of. That's, what I be, that's why I believe we talk a lot about Jenny. And, and, I, and you look at her photograph, I mean, it's, it's a whoosh, Quite a, quite a photograph to be looking at, just for something to talk about. But anyway, um, that's, that's my theory on why we talk about Jenny more than anybody else. Um, in 18, 19, excuse me, 1980, Dora Scheidecker, who was a counselor here in the Valley at the high school when there was only one, she retired, and she lived in Jacksonville. And she wanted something to do. And so she got involved with the Southern Oregon Historical Society, better known at the time as the Jacksonville Museum. And she wanted to help. Well, she was a quilter, so she decided she would help with the quilts that were in the Historical Society's collection. And there were some of them that needed repairs, and so she would go in and diligently spend a couple hours repairing some of the quilts, which of course, historians now get really cranky about anybody touching their things. You don't, you don't fix things anymore. You have to leave them the way they were. But Dora was fixing quilts, and then she ran across a couple piles of just quilt blocks. And she said, oh, well, I'll, I'll just put those together, and then you'll have a new item to display. And so she did that for a while. And she formed a group of like-minded ladies that liked to quilt. And they enjoyed working on the historical items. And she formed the Jacksonville Museum Quilters. And their primary function was to work with the quilts in the historical, section, uh, historical society's collection. Well, she ran out of quilts after a little while. And so they just started building quilts for themselves. Then Dora decided she was going to make one historical quilt every year for their quilt show. In 1981, the uh, Historical Society started producing the Table Rock Sentinel, which was their newsletter. Their editor, publisher, and illustrator was Ray Lewis. And Ray Lewis was a music teacher in Medford, again, when there was only one high school. And he retired, and he also was looking for something to do. So he took on the newsletter. Well, Ray 
had pretty much carte blanche. He, he, he did pretty much what he wanted. If he wanted to research a subject, he did. If he couldn't find a picture of it out in the collection, well, he'd draw one. And then he'd type up the material and put it together into the newsletter and issue a newsletter. And in October 1981, he decided to do one on the Tequilma Indians. And I want to, I want to read what he wrote because he really sets the scene really nicely. So this, is, this is the kind of publication he was putting together at the time. And he says, they were our Indians and we destroyed them. Don't look for them like the northern cur curlew and the passenger pigeon, they are no more. They weren't very many of them, even in the beginning. 500, 600. Other tribal groups lived in the adjoining lands, but the Tequilma inhabited the Rogue River Valley from the Illinois River south to the Siskiyou Mountain Range. They claimed the Bear Creek Valley, Upper Applegate, the Jacksonville Country, and the valleys and foothills surrounding the Table Rock area. They took their name from the Indian word Degelma, which means those living along the river. One must go and stand on a hill and look over the valley, mentally erasing from his sight the freeway, the overpasses, the roads, the buildings, the orchards, the bridges, the people, and see only the land and the river and the sky. That was the world of the Tequilma. Oak and pine trees, chaparral, manzanita, climbed the slopes at the base of the table rocks. Deep forests grew there, here and there in the valley. And the rogue, one of his illustrations also. Rapid and often dangerous, coursed its way along the valley floor. The Tequilma had lived in this beautiful country for as long as they could remember. They weren't threatening in appearance. The mid had, men had pleasing features and were no wise sullen or distrustful in their behavior. And he has that in quotes. They averaged about five feet, eight inches in height and were muscular and athletic. The women were smaller than, were smaller with rather pretty faces and graceful hands and feet. They lived in small groups of two or three families together because large bands would soon deplete the game in the area. In winter, they dwelt in the wooden huts built over, the, over any rectangular dugout. The floor was crowded with woven mats and drying meat hung from the ceiling. A hole in the roof let out smoke from the fire. In the summer, they lived in wigwams. The Tequilma were one of the few tribes that did not plant crops. Game was plentiful and the region abounded with acorns, berries, and nuts. Even so, it was not a life of complete ease. Everyone had his duties. Did Ray do a good job? That's Indian Jenny, of course. And you can see that she has many names. And her name is spelled with an I-E and with a Y. She's also supposedly married to someone with the last name of Jane. However, when the census taker took the census that year, he wrote Jin. We don't know why, but anyway. She's also pos possibly married to a gentleman named George. Princess Jenny came later. But we'll, we'll get into Princess Jenny in a few minutes, but. And then there's also one source that calls her Mary. And that makes life really confusing. And it, it also makes it really confusing if you go in and try and find Jenny online under any of those names. Because there are a gazillion of them, and none of them are my Jenny. <laughs> so, OK. Um, most of what we know about Jenny is the obituary that appeared in the paper May 14th, 1893. And it, it said, 
Old Jenny, the last of the famous tribe of Rogue Rivers, died here this morning after a protracted illness, aged about 65. Old Jenny is still, will, will, it will be remembered, anticipated her death, prepared with her own hands in the most costly and elaborate manner her burial robe, the material of which is of buckskin, handsomely ornamented with many colored beads, seashells, Indian money, beautiful transparent pebbles, etc. The whole weighing nearly 50 pounds. This death closed the last chapter in the sad drama of an historic tribe, than which no braver or more determined ever confronted and fell before the superior forces of civilization. Old Jenny was laid to rest in her burial robe this evening. So, what does that tell us, if anything? Well, that's where the, the Takilma lived. Was she the last of her tribe? Probably not, as there are descendants that come to the valley occasionally for ceremonies now. Um, is, it, is it Agnes Pilgrim? Yes, Agnes Pilgrim. It's one of, the, one of those that we're most familiar with. But she was, they don't say in the obituaries, it's with the Rogue River Indians. What tribe is that? Well, it's probably the Tehilma. Ethnographers and anthropologists didn't put together the name Tehilma with a specific language group until about 1900. Before that, they were all just Roganians. So, you know, she would never have recognized probably the word Tequilma as a tribal name. She was just a rogue Indian. Just a rogue Indian. Well, that's not, that wasn't very nice. Anyway, um, they were known, they were called rogues because they lived on the Rogue River. And because once the white man came, they become, became quite fierce and determined to protect their own land. So they were known as rogues. Um, as, as Ray said, they lived on the middle section of the Rogue River and along the Illinois Valley. Uh, over here on, behind me on this side, as I said, um, Peter Britt wasn't here to take photographs. So we don't know what an Indian, rogue Indian tribe home site looked like. In 1989, 1989, the Southern Oregon Historical Society put together an exhibit called Living with the Land. And it was one of the largest retrospectives on our Indians that had been done in 100 years. When, and I, I was part of the uh, <clears throat> exhibits committee, so I got to participate in putting it together. And one of our biggest problems was how do you show their lifestyle? There are no photographs. And you get tired of putting up little black and white drawings if you can find someone to do one. So we had Dora Scheidecker make us some panels and she, she applied these panels based on drawings done by Jerry Bailey, who was a volunteer with the Historical Society. Processing acorns, you have to hull them first of all, then you have to leach the acid out of them, then you pound them into a paste, and then you make, then you make your little patties and that kind of thing from the paste. But you, you have this whole process, and the leaching process can take several weeks. So you've got a hole in the ground that you've got your little nuts in, and you put water on, and then they, they le it leaches the acid out and makes it possible to eat them, because otherwise they're very, very bitter. So that, that was a time-consuming process. Uh, there is a drawing of possible 
what we believe the, where they lived. And then of course, everyday life, fishing was a major source of, of, of protein. Hunting, uh, gathering, they were always gathering seeds, nuts, whatever was available. And again, preparing them. Which, you know, how do you, how do you keep your fish in the winter so that you have food all through the winter? So all of those were things probably Jenny did. One of the things I, I got to thinking about is, in her obituary, it said she was 65 years old in 1893. That would have made her born around 1828. White men didn't show up here in the valley until the 1850s. So Jenny would have been in her 20s, at least. So she probably did these kinds of things every day because that's what her life was until a white man came and disrupted everything. But that's, we don't have any photographs and our natives were never here to be here to show us what they were trying to do. You had to go clear up to Grand Ronde and Salette and of course not many very, not very many people did that kind of thing. There is a uh, I, I'm saying that she's probably Tequilma. There are three um, language groups in the Tequilma family. There's a, an upper Tequilma, a lower Tequilma, and northern, there we go. We don't know which one she was. You know, we're, we're just assuming that she was Tequilma. There's, there's one source, and I'll, we'll come to it in a minute, that said she was part of the clique Klickitat, Klickitat tribe. Well, they were up by the Columbia River, and one one source. Oh no, they they migrated down here to the Rogue Valley in the 1850s. And they were here in the 1850s. But would Jenny have come all the way down in that migration? So the possibility of her being a click a cat, a click a cat, whatever it is. It, I think it's fairly small. I think we're safe with saying that she's still come up. Let's see what else we learned. About 65 years old, so she would have been 28. Uh, no, she would have been in her early 20s. More than likely, she would have been married. Most Indian girls were married by the time they were 20 years old. Did she have any children? We don't know. Nobody, nobody mentioned that. It's not in her obituary. There is one source I'm coming up on that also says that she had a son. Well, I'm, I'm waiting for Roger and, and, and Chuck to find that grave because it's supposed to be buried next to, to, next to her, her cabin. Her son was supposedly buried next to her cabin. In 1863 when he was hung at Camp Baker. He was one of those that was hung at Camp Baker. Um, when Jenny died, Elisha Applegate claimed he knew her. And he, he, he wrote this little obituary type thing. And I, I don't know how many of you know anything about Elisha Applegate. He was, part, he was the oldest son of Lindsay Applegate, the three Applegate brothers that came to Oregon in 1843. And we all know, and all, all told, the three brothers had 42 children. <laughs> Lysha was, was Lindsay's oldest, and he came to the valley in 1859. And he did many, many things, but Lysha loved to talk, and he loved big words, even if he couldn't pronounce them correctly and wasn't exactly sure what they meant, he loved big words, and he would, he would expound. And people got to the point where they knew if Elisha was going to be up there, you had at least a half an hour of, of talking going on. But anyway, he wrote about Jenny, which gives us maybe a little picture of part of her life. He said that Jenny had been one of about a dozen Indian women 
who had made their homes for some time in Jacksonville among the white people. These women were given comfortable quarters at the encampment of the soldiers. And we're ta he's talking at the time of the Rogue Indian Wars. I believe this was the, the 1853 portion of that war. Had, uh, quarters at the, the encampment of the soldiers and were supplied with saddle ponies and went every day from the camp to the of the soldiers to that of the Indians and labored to dissuade the natives from their contemplated general assault upon the whites. They argued that the cause of the Indian could not triumph except for a little time at most as the whites were bound to keep coming in increasing numbers and would soon crush them out with their superior forces if the Indians attempted a war of extermination. They paved the way for the treaty. Not a whole lot of sources back up what he's saying, but he was here. So maybe, maybe that's what happened. But anyway, I think also he's the one that gave Jenny the name, okay, I can't, I can't pronounce it. Lady Ashakashawara, whatever, whatever the one they throw at her. <laughs> it's, it's, it's about this long, which is typical of Lysha. And he, he was trying to honor her. And so he, he gave her, I think he gave her that name. But that's, that's of course, is my opinion. After this uh, battle of 1853, they, they're, a, a, a treaty was signed and a reservation was laid out. And as you can see on the 1855 map there, then highlighted in blue, is where the Table Rock Reservation was supposed to be. The other map is, also shows the same thing but is broken up more into sections and townships. The treaty outlined the, the reservation and said, okay, we're gonna move all you guys on there and we're gonna take care of you. And we'll give you food and clothes and we'll build your houses. And everything will be wonderful. And you won't have any trouble with a white man because we'll protect you. That's why the soldiers are here. Well, of course, we all know that that lasted about two years and then we had another huge fight and they picked up all of the Native Americans that they had carefully placed on this reservation and hauled them all up to Eugene and Salem. Not in Eugene, up to Salem. In truth, I think they ratified the, this, the treaty here in 1854, and then the middle of 1854. But all that time before that, they never got around to putting any food or clothing or housing. They just rounded up everybody and put them on the reservation, said, you stay there and, and we'll be taking care of you pretty soon. But the government never gave them any money to do it. And so it was, it was tough times there and part of the reason probably that there was an 1855 war. Because in October of 1855 is when the Lupton massacre occurred that ended up being the beginning of the end. But again, there, again, there's no photographs of the Lupton Massacre or of any of the events around that last battle. So this is what we put up, so we'd have something to illustrate it, to, 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 put, to put some words around so that there would be something other than just words on the wall. How we came up with these photographs. In 1852, the young lady on the, the right there, her name is Rowena Nichols. And Rowena actually grew up just outside Ashland, at the end of Oak Street in Ashland, over on, on the other side of the creek. And she married a gentleman by the name of Nichols. Her, her name was Bunyard at the time. And uh, she married a gentleman by the name of Nichols. And they moved up to Eugene. And then from Eugene, they went over to Eastern Washington. And after 22 years, Rowena decided she wanted to be an artist. And she didn't want to be Mrs. Nichols anymore. 
And so she divorced her husband. And she went to art school. And then she went up to Seattle. And she started giving art lessons up there. And started developing a reputation as a, a very competent, good artist. Well, in 1892, actually probably, probably in 1891, the United States government decided to okay the Columbia Exposition in Chicago to be held in 1893, commemorating the landing of Christopher Columbus on America. It had been 100 years, or 200? Would that be, that'd be 200, wouldn't it? And yeah, anyway, they decided they were gonna, it was time to celebrate that wonderful event. And so they authorized this exposition in Chicago. Well, magnanimous that they were, they decided there could be a woman's building at the exposition, something never heard of before. So the ladies in Chicago got busy and said, if we're gonna have a woman's building, we're gonna put stuff in it. And it's gonna be wonderful woman stuff. And so they arranged for two representatives from each state in the union. And they all got together in Chicago and said, all right, gals, we gotta to get together and we gotta get some wonderful stuff to put in this building. And we're, we get to design this building and we're gonna fill it with wonderful things. So each of these two representatives then went home and started collecting things from their home state. And they formed groups that they called the World, Women's World's Fair Club. And there were local groups in all, on most of the major towns. And their job was to find something wonderful made by a woman that they could display in Chicago and tell people about Oregon. They, I, well, I don't have, this is one of those puzzle things that we don't know exactly how it came about, but apparently there was a competition. And Rowena was selected from, in the competition to produce a painting, typical of Oregon, to show to, in, in the exposition. So in January 1892, Rowena came to the Rogue Valley. And she started meeting with the ladies, the local ladies, and saying, okay, what are we gonna do? What, you know, what, what, is it, what, what do you want me to paint? Well, they decided that they wanted the table rocks in the foreground of the painting with Rogue River at the base. The painting will be seven and a half feet by five feet and will be framed in a beautiful mo mosaic of Southern Oregon woods and an inner setting of natural native ores. Pretty impressive. If you, if you could see, if, if the, this wasn't so blurred from being enlarged, you would see that there's a picture that she's painting of Table Rock on her easel. So Rowena came and she started going out doing sketches of Table Rock. But nobody was really paying her for this and so she started giving art lessons. And she had a, 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 a class in the Orth Building in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. She had another one at the Oregon Hotel in um, Ashland. And then she also had taught classes over in Grants Pass. She also went to the Oregon Caves over out of Grads Pass. I'd never seen any of, the, any of her artwork from that, but supposedly she created artwork over there. So that's how she kept herself financed. She, um, in July, she felt she had enough drawings and it was time for her to leave. But somewhere along the line, and we don't know how, and if you think about it, how would she get together with Jenny? How would she meet Jenny? Jenny was a Native American woman in probably her 40s, middle 50s. Probably doing manual labor, working in someone's house, doing someone's laundry. Maybe she did, maybe Jenny did Rowena's laundry. I don't know. 
Anyway, but Jenny and Rowena met. And Rowena was just fascinated with Jenny's gown. I've got to paint Jenny. I've just got to paint her. But I don't have time right now. I have to finish my table walk painting. So she convinced Jenny to have her picture taken. But in order to show her that it was going to be OK, she had her own picture taken. So see, see Jenny, it's OK. You can, you can have your picture taken. It won't hurt you. And if you look at some of the things, the props around her, they show up in Jenny's photographs also. There were three pictures taken of Jenny. And of course you can see what an elaborate gown Jenny had created. Does she look 65 to you? No. Not even close. Especially the one over on, on the far side. And, and notice that she's, what she's got in her hand. She's got Oregon grapes in her hand. That kind of fits in with my theory on when her photograph was taken. Because Rowena was here, but she was leaving in July. When does an Oregon grape have fruit on it? June and July. These have grapes. And you can see that the, the, it's the holly berry, you know, like a, um, like the Oregon grape has. So my theory is that this photograph was taken in June or July of 1892. And nobody else knew that before me. <laughs> and there's, of course, the iconic image of Jenny. But notice all the, the, the fur around her feet and, the, uh, again, the Oregon grapes and that, that fake stone that she's leaning against there. Rowena did a, an interview with Western Trails in April of 1900, which is eight years later. And in it, she actually quotes Jenny, which I, th I, I, I have so few tidbits about Jenny. You got to hear all of them. Anyway, the, the article said, Miss Marina Nichols, the talented artist who has been employed by the World's Fair Committee to paint the table rocks, has procured a number of sketches of this interesting subject and will paint a life-size picture of old Jenny wrapped in her gorgeous gown. One little tidbit adds to Jenny's story. During the war, wait a minute. During the wars was once captured, oh, that Jenny was once captured by the whites and later rescued by her people. I don't know anywhere else I've ever heard that. Miss Rowena Nichols says, when I posed old Jenny for her picture, she looked down for a few moments and her lips quivered. Then looking at me with a pitiful little smile, she said, I am sorry for myself. She died in about three or four more, it was actually about 10 months, after the picture was taken and was buried in her historic robe. But Jenny felt sorry for herself. I'm not sure why she would do that, I mean, given her life, I could imagine why she'd feel sorry. One of the things that has come up about Jenny is that she doesn't look 65 years old in her photographs. And of course, everybody wonders, well, well she can't possibly be 65 years old. She doesn't have any wrinkles. Well, she also doesn't have any tattooing. And to Kilma, women at that point in time, or when, when she was in her 20s, had tattooing on their chin. Where's the tattooing? The other thing, you look at her hands. Are those a 65-year-old woman's hands who's done manual labor all of her life? <laughs> it, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't it, 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 people question. Most people suggest that she had a touch-up either airbrushed or with a paintbrush. Very well done, if you ask me, but um, 
just for your information, because I, I've got your ears, um, it, the airbrush equipment was not introduced until 1893 at the Columbia Exposition. <laughs> so any work that was done on her photographs was probably done either after 1893 or it was done with just a paintbrush and a steady hand before that. Just to, so you can see what a difference retouching can make. This is Mrs. Miller. And Mrs. Miller actually was Rowena's hostess when she first came to the valley. And she lived outside Jacksonville, just north of Jacksonville. And this, it isn't a Peter Britt photograph, so we, we can't say that Peter could do this. But somebody was certainly talented, and it certainly made a lot of difference. And this is, this is what I was talking about with the Oregon grapes. That's what, and unfortunately, blowing up the, the segments of the photographs, you can't see it as clearly. But um, it bears fruit in June or July, so that would have to be, I, I would say, when the photograph was taken, because those are, are branches of Oregon grape that are in the photograph. That was my epiphany two days ago. I woke up in the morning and said, oh, Oregon grapes. Jenny's photograph has been used for many, many things. She's been on postcards forever. People colorize it. We don't know what colors they are, other than the buckskin. What colors did Jenny have on her gown? We don't know. Up on the, on the right hand side there is a, a drawing that was made based on Jenny's photograph by Dorothy Vore, and it was made in 18, uh, 1979 for the, for the Jacksonville Museum. Intriguing, because on the back, Dorothy put that. And she, she's the one that claims Jenny was named Mary, and that she was of the Klickitats tribe. Maybe. This is where they talk about her son also and the fact that he was buried next to her cabin after he was hung in 1863 at Camp Baker. There's another story out there that um, Jenny lived on Peter Britt's property and he had a number of small cabins on his property and he let the Chinese and some of the Native Americans live in those cabins on his property. Is he maybe buried next to one of the cabins on Peter Britt's property? Don't know. But it, it, she, claim, she claims that the information came from uh, Walling's History of Southern Oregon. I haven't seen it, and I've never seen her called Indian Mary except there. When Dora started creating this quilt, she had them blow up the photographs and there's you, you can come up and look at them later uh, to show the the uh, the, the beadwork and the embroidery the door that uh, Jenny did on her quilt and there's she tried to blow them up as much as she could to get some kind of detail then she created a drawing. She traced over the top of it to, to try again, trying to decide how much she was going to be able to represent. I think that Dora stood in front of a, a bright light and had someone trace around her image to get the dimensions for this, this image on her quilt. Otherwise, she'd spend an awful lot of time drafting, and I, I, I don't see Dora doing that kind of thing. I think she would have been much more practical and just stood there in front of the shadow and let somebody draw around her and, and said, okay, there's my image, and that's, that's the right proportions, and, uh, and started working from that. The fabric is cotton suede cloth, and I, I just love the way it drapes, and she allowed enough of it in there for it to drape. 
Dora wanted to have uh, the features as lifelike as she could. So she took a soft sculpture class. Now, many of you are old enough to remember the little jars we had of, with the nylon faces in them. And they all had all these eyes and nose that made out of nylon stockings. And this was, oh, <clears throat> several years ago, 30 or so <laughs> <laughs> years ago. And um, she took a class to learn how to do that. And if you look at the face that she created with a nylon stocking and some batting, pretty phenomenal. And the hand is quite wonderful also. So this is, the, this is what she had created by May. She'd already been working on it for several months. Seven months later, that's where she was at. And before anybody asks, I don't know where the hair came from. I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's synthetic. I don't know if it's a horse's tail. But it's a long piece of real hair. <laughs> and when you get up to take a look at the quilt, check out the hat. She couldn't weave it. But was she, no, she couldn't do a basket. But she wove eighth inch wide silk ribbon to create that hat. It isn't exactly like the real one, but it's okay. There, there are the numbers, over a thousand buttons, shells, one by one, she sewed them on. She did the embroidery. She had help from the quilters doing the, the leaves and the greenery around it. And of course they helped her with the quilting. The quilting is supposed to be stylized wokus. Being not an authority on wokus, I'm not sure what, what that is. <coughs> Looks like it might be Oregon grape there on the, one on the, on the left side, which would, which would fit in with the photograph. And it comes to 46 and a half inches by 70 and a half. Now, there's one more piece of her legacy. This is Rowena again. The, the, she had two pictures taken that day. And you can see, if you could look at the close, closely at the photograph, that those are all three Table Rock paintings. She had different images that she, sketches that she was going, planning to use for her big painting. She went down to San Francisco to create her painting. Um, anyway, Rowena wanted to paint Jenny, but she had other things going on. A couple marriages, she ended up marrying another two times. Um, she also started showing, she had the painting on exhibit at the uh, Columbia Pacific. Rowena went to Alaska by herself, searching for her half-brother during the Alaska gold rush. She was up there for four or five years. She, didn't f she found, found graphite and some gold. And she did paintings all over the place. Well, somehow or other, she met the territorial governor of Alaska. And he was collecting items to put in the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in 1904. And he saw some of her paintings and decided they were wonderfully, typically Alaskan and he needed them for his exhibit. And so she had 12 of her paintings in the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. And that's the Alaska building and that she was up on the second floor. And there's lovely totem poles out in front also. Well, then the territorial governor heard about the Lewis and Clark Exposition coming in 1905. And so he just packed up his whole exhibit and took it to Portland, Oregon. And put it back up. Well, he lost a couple of his totem poles, but he used Rowena's paintings still. So she had, through 1905, she was stowing artwork in these various expositions. So she didn't have time to paint Jenny. 
So she decided, well, life settled down after Alaska, and so she would, she heard about Seattle's plans for the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition taking place in 1909-1910. She still wanted to do Jenny. So she decided to create a statue of Jenny. Uh, let, me, let me read you what the Seattle paper put in, in there when they, when they finally got around to describing it. She was working with a sculptor named August Hubert, who was well known on the exposition circuit also. He did a lot of the, the, the statuary on many of the buildings in the various expositions. And he and sh the two of them together created this statue. One of the most ex interesting works of art will be found in the Oregon State Building, a marble statue, one half heroic size, which means it's about six feet tall, of old Jenny, the last of the Rogue River Indians who died of old age 17 years ago in Southern Oregon. At the close of the fair, the statues will, now pay attention. At the close of the fair, the statue will be turned over to the Oregon Historical Society and placed in its collection. Remember that. The statue, which is exquisitely done, is the joint work of Miss Rowena Nichols Lines, she's married again, and August Hubert, a German sculptor who did a great deal of work at the Chicago and St. Louis fairs and who is employed by the exposition officials on various works of statuary. The statue represents old Jenny clad in her buckskin burial robe, which weighed 50 pounds, which was made in accordance with the laws of her race for she was of royal lineage and it was proper for her to be buried in the garment of her race. Well, that's a newspaper copy of a picture of the, of the statue. And of course, you can tell from the quality that it ain't wonderful and it doesn't reproduce well. But where is that statue? <laughs> Nobody knows about it. Nobody talks about it. It's just gone. We found one little tidbit in 1912. In 1912, issue of Arts and Architecture magazine. In a review of August Hubert's work, it reported that the, now it's Princess Jenny, statue was in New York being cast in bronze. The Oregon Historical Society does not know anything about it. No one that I've been able to get re respond to me uh, at the state government, Oregon state government, is aware of Jenny. Where's Jenny? Where did it, you know, where, where is this statue? It, it seems like it ought to be out there. The only, th the only other thing I can think of, you know, did it go to New York and never come back? If it went in 1912, how long does it take for a statue to be cast in bronze? Did it, did she get caught up in the problem with the war? World War I came four years later. Would her bronze have need, been needed for casings, shell casings or something like that? Would it, should she have been melted because nobody knew who she was? I don't know, and I wanna know. Where's this statue? It, it belongs here in Jackson County. We got to find it. <laughs> so, so, this is your job. I made up a little flyer here for you guys. 
So you can take home a picture of her, of her paper, of, of her. Somebody's got to know where it's at. It's out there, but where? You know, it's sitting in someone's yard somewhere. You know, they don't know that it's Jenny. They just know it's an Indian person. And they think it's cool, and so they've got it stuck in their yard somewhere. Or who knows, maybe it's sitting in a cemetery somewhere. I don't know. But it's out there. It's marble. Come on, it's got to be somewhere. So that's your job, guys. OK. <laughs> Help me find this statue. And I, I even gave you an email address so you can, you can call me when you tell me when you find it. <laughs> so so we, can, we can get it back here in Jackson County. So that's our campaign. And I think that's probably all I probably ought to say. <laughs>